Hello, welcome to Psych 105, Introduction to Psychology. Today we're going to be talking about the brain. So before we tar start really getting into the meat and potatoes of the brain, so to speak, if you're a zombie, I want to go over the architecture of the brain um, just so that we have a pretty good idea of where things are. So we're going to start at the front or the frontal lobe and this is responsible for things like movement, problem solving, concentrating, thinking, mood, and personality. When you are on the teenager to young adult side, this is in still in development, and this is when you have problems with impulse control, making good decisions, and um, we'll be talking about this in a lot more attention throughout the, ter the term. Going south, we're moving to the temporal lobe, where it is in purple, and this focuses in on things like hearing, language, and memory. Going even further south, sort of the Florida of our brain, the cerebellum, this is responsible for our posture, our balance, our coordination of movement. Going to the right, the occipital lobe, which is blue in this picture, is responsible for vision and perception. Finally, the parietal lobe is responsible for sensations, language, perception also, body awareness, and attention. Getting even deeper into the brain, there are a few areas that I really want to focus in on because they're going to be important throughout the rest of the term because these play a huge role in the issues that we're going to be discussing whether they are relative to psychosis or mental disorders or just problems with sleeping or memory. So again, starting on the left hand side with the prefrontal cortex, this coordinates and adjusts complex behavior, impulse control, control of emotional reactions, personality, focusing and organizing attention, and complex planning. Going south to the amygdala, this is such an important um, little piece of our brain, but it connects emotion and memory. This is where we learn how to be afraid. And this is evolutionarily why we have managed to survive, because we learn that you don't jump into a pool of fire because that is going to hurt a lot. Whereas jumping into a nice cool swimming pool in the hot days of summer is going to feel good. So people who have damage to their amygdala oftentimes have lost their ability to learn what to be afraid of and they take risks that go beyond what a normal person would take. Finally, they help convert short-term memory into long-term memory. Going up to the top right, the hypothalamus function maintains body homeostasis, regulates sleep, and it releases oxytocin, which is also known as the cuddle hormone. So when you hold a baby, when you um, feel really happy inside, these are the feelings that you get when oxytocin is released. Oxytocin, by the way, is also released when you orgasm, which is why after you have your orgasm, you want to cuddle and then get a sandwich. So finally, the hippocampus function turns information into learning and memory. So if you think about it, all day we're being bombarded by data, by information, whether it's noise or pictures or data from our phones, and most of it we're able to block out. But a few pieces of information actually stick. So that stuff that sticks has been turned into learning and memory. Stress can cause damage to this area, and a shrinking hippocampus is associated with dementia and depression. If you go on antidepressants, that can reverse the problems that um, 
you may experience with a shrimp shrinking hippocampus. So let's talk about the brain as we know it. It is 1,350 grams, which is about mm, just under three pounds. It is fueled by sugar, or otherwise known as glucose, and oxygen. Very important, which is why you need to make sure you have breakfast before you come to class or you go to work. It's important to have complex carbohydrates that'll turn into good sugars and not just pop tarts which turn into bad sugars. And why when a lot of people take exams they feel themselves freeze up. It's because they're hyperventilating and they're not getting deep cleansing breaths. They're not getting the oxygen to the brain. There's about one trillion cells divided into neurons and glial cells. The typical structure of your neuron is on the left and you'll see the dendrite on the left and the axon terminal on the right and you have in the middle the axon, the myelin sheath, the Schwann cell and the node of Ravignier. On the right hand side is an astrocyte. It is a type of glial cell. Now just to kind of put this in context, this class is about psychology so we need to learn a little bit about the brain but it's not an anatomy class so we're not going to go deep into learning um, every aspect of the brain. So we're using what we need to learn about psychological issues. So we're going to start off with discussing glial cells in more detail. Glial is Greek for glue. These cells are non-neuronal cells that provide support and nutrition and form myelin, provide scaffolding to guide the growth of developing neurons and support mature neurons, wrap around neurons to prevent interference from other electrical signals, release chemicals that influence a neuron's growth and function, and they participate in signal transmission in the nervous system. So they're kind of your supporting um, cells in the brain. In the human brain, glia are estimated to outnumber neurons by 10 to 1. And what that comes out to mathematically is there's about 900 billion glial cells compared to 100 billion neurons. All of that in that three pound uh, gelatinous thing in your head. Then we have our neurons. These are responsive cells that process and transmit information by chemical signals. We're going to talk about these chemical signals in a lot more detail later. Neurons respond to stimulus and communicate the presence of that stimulus to the central nervous system which processes that information and sends responses to other parts of the body for action with two extensions. One receives electrical signals and those are dendrites and one transmits electrical signals and those are axons. Neural functions are reception of sensory information so you touch something that's super hot and you're going to feel it. Control of muscle movement regulates our digestion, it secretes hormones, and we engage in complex mental processes, whether that's thinking, imagining, dreaming, or remembering. New neurons grow in the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb. 100 trillion connections in the child's brain form during their development. So you know, while the child is growing up, all of these connections are being made, which is why it's so important to make sure that your child is being stimulated intellectually, socially, environmentally. Any cognitive stimulation is going to create a connection. Nature makes more brain cells than we will need to secure to ensure that the brain will be able to form sufficient connections. Neurons that do not make connections die. This process continues throughout life, so it's a use it or lose it concept. Those that make connections survive. 
and during infancy connections among the neurons increase so from that minute where your baby is born through that first 18 months your baby is growing not just physically but their brain is learning so much they're learning how to walk they're learning how to feed themselves they're learning how to make noises that become words they're learning how to communicate verbally and verbally. I mean if you think about it, everything that a baby has to do in that first 18 months it is pretty phenomenal how much they accomplish neurons function as electrical nerve impulses or messages that travel along the neurons. Neurons communicate with one another. The dendrite of one cell receives a message from the axon of another cell. The space between the dendrite and the axon is called a synapse. To cross a synapse, the nerve impulse needs a neurotransmitter, which are chemical transmitters. Once the message has crossed the synapse, it reverts to being an electrical signal. So you are basically combining chemical engineering and electrical engineering for our neural pathways to effectively work. You know, our brain is the ultimate engineering project because it's using all kinds of engineering inside of it. And, you know, what it manages to do on any given five minutes is an amazing task. There are three types of neurons. We have sensory neurons which respond to touch, sound, light, and numerous other stimuli affecting cells of the sensory organs that then send signals to the spinal cord and brain. Motor neurons receive signals from the brain and spinal cord and cause muscle contractions and affect glands. Then we have interneurons, which connect neurons to other neurons within the brain and spinal cord. Here are uh, the three neurons and how they look in terms of their action. The top left is our sensory neuron, and you'll see the neuron for smell and vision. On the right top, we have our motor neuron. And then on the bottom, we have our central nervous system interneuron. And you'll see the dendrites, the cell body, the axon. Neural connections. Infants gobble up information from the outside world through their sense organs. Ears, eyes, touch receptors and skin, olfactory receptors and nasal cavity, taste buds, papillae on the tongue. So. Again, when we think about what a baby is doing as it kind of just lays there staring at us, it is absorbing data and it is reading its environment. Environmental stimulation, parents, teachers, siblings, anyone who comes in contact, affects all parts of the brain. Therefore, it's important to talk to a baby because the language areas of the brain respond resulting in superior language skills for the child. So a child who has a parent or grandparent who talks to it, him, her, constantly is going to more than likely be an early speaker because they are learning the rhythms, they're learning the sounds, they're learning the dialogue concept. It is also very important to surround an infant with a warm, emotionally supportive environment, which results in more connections in those parts of the brain responsible for developing emotions and pro-social behaviors. What are pro-social behaviors? Things like sharing, empathy. You know, we always tell our kids, you know, you should share. Don't hit him. Don't hit your brother. Don't hit your brother. Don't hit your brother. That was kind of the mantra at my house because I think uh, my poor brother got beat up a lot. This results in a child who feels secure and experiences emotional well-being that spreads throughout all aspects of a child's life. So even from the very beginning, these neural connections are vital. And even in terms of their emotional well-being, the more neural connections, the better. 
So one of the big questions that a lot of us have asked over time, because we've seen the commercials, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs kind of thing, uh, with the egg on the frying pan, researchers have concluded that adult monkey and human brains are capable of growing a relatively limited number of neurons throughout our adulthood. Some new neurons play an important role in continuing to learn and remember new things via the hippocampus. However, and this is the thing, a heavy drug user who is killing brain cells will not be able to grow new brain cells as fast as they are killing them. So, you know, somebody who has a few cocktails once in a while or, um, you know, in states where it is legal, smokes marijuana on occasion, they're going to kill a few brain cells, yes, but they're not killing so many that the brain can't keep up. Whereas somebody who is a, um, an addict who is using it far beyond what they should be, they're going to kill more brain cells than they can afford. And it'll be apparent as they sit there like a lump in their 30s or 40s, unable to process information. So let's talk about repairing the brain because advances in stem research, stem cell research, suggest that the human brain may be able to grow more neurons to repair the damage caused by things like traumatic accidents or diseases like epilepsy. In 2014, researchers at the University of Munich in Germany found that by injecting mice with viruses carrying a short piece of extra genetic code, scientists were able to coax structural NG2 glia cells in the damaged part of the brain to develop into neurons. So we're talking about creating a way of growing neurons in the brain because they were damaged due to a disease like a stroke or they were in a motorcycle accident or a horse back riding accident or epilepsy. These then grew in the injured area and were found to be capable of receiving signals from neurons around the damaged area. The study raises hopes that damaged brain tissue can be repaired in patients who suffer from epilepsy or those who have had a stroke or a traumatic injury. So this is really important and big news because a lot of times people, once they've been injured, that's it. They are a vegetable in a sense. And this is hope that we can move forward. Now, here's the important thing. Here's where I get on my soapbox. In this country, in the United States right now, we have a very anti-science leadership. What we need to do is we need to make sure our leaders know how important science is. And that's why it's important to be voting and to stay informed and know what's going on in the world. Because one day you may be in a car accident and you will need something like this. And you don't want to have to go to Germany to get this done. You want to stay in your own country and get this done. So. I'm off my soapbox, moving forward. One of the big neural diseases that uh, we have all been exposed to on some level, whether it's through our own family or a friend of a family or even just seeing it on television, is Alzheimer's. And it is a devastating disease where a person literally just forgets how to be a person. Um, researchers believe that some of the genetic instructions become faulty and an abnormal buildup in the brain of a cement-like substance that gradually destroys neurons. The brain loses its ability to transmit information, causes memory and cognitive difficulties, and destroys neurons many times faster than the brain's limited capacity for regrowth, repair, or re rewiring. So you know, this kind of disease is so significant. And when we learn how to repair neurons, we are hoping that at some point, a disease like Alzheimer's will become like polio, where it's a disease of the past. Nobody gets it anymore. So moving on, we have our nervous system. 
there are two pieces to our nervous system. We have our peripheral nervous system, which is made up of nerves that are located throughout the body, except in the brain and spinal cord. The central nervous system is made up of the neurons located in the brain and spinal cord. So the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, everything else is peripherals. So if you want to think of it like a computer, your central processing unit and your printer and your uh, mouse and your keyboard are peripherals. But that computer, that brain, that central processing unit is the central nervous system equivalent. The divisions of the per peripheral nervous system, <clears throat> we have the somatic, which are receptors and nerves concerned with changes in the outside environment, and it keeps the body in touch with the outside world. The autonomic or automatic systems, the part of the nervous system responsible for control of the bodily functions, not consciously directed, such as breathing, the heartbeat, and digestive systems and maintains internal balance, basically our homeostasis, our everything's working correctly. Um, there are times that people have been in comas and they breathe, their heart beats, they're able to um, digest food that is fed to them through a feeding tube, but their brain is essentially gone, but the automatic systems are still functioning. Nerves carry information from the senses, skin, muscles, and the body's organs to and from the spinal cord. Nerves in the peripheral nervous system have the ability to grow or reattach if severed or damaged, which is why if a person loses a finger, it can be reattached and through therapy, it can be functional again. The conduction of nerve impulses is an example of an all or nothing response. In other words, if a neuron responds at all, then it must respond completely. So we're going to move on to neurotransmitters. And these are the brain chemicals that communicate information throughout our brain and body. They relay signals between neurons. The brain uses neurotransmitters to tell your heart to beat, your lungs to breathe, and your stomach to digest. They can also affect mood, sleep, concentration, weight, and can, key, can cause adverse symptoms when they are out of balance. Neurotransmitter levels can be depleted in many ways. It is estimated that 86% of Americans have below ideal neurotransmitter levels. Stress, poor diet, neurotoxins, genetic predispositions, drugs, prescription and recreational, alcohol, caffeine usage can cause these levels to be out of optimal range. So, you know, there's a whole variety of things that can affect neurotransmitters, but the reality is these are such an important part of how our brain functions. So we're going to start off with serotonin, which might be the one that people are most familiar with. In the central nervous system, serotonin plays an important role in the modulation of anger, aggression, body temperature, mood, sleep, human sexuality, appetite, and metabolism. Depression and anxiety can result if our body does not make enough serotonin or if we do not have enough receptor cells in our brain. So we have cells on our brain that seek out serotonin and if we don't have enough of those, then it's like throwing a ton of spaghetti at one person. They can only eat so much. The serotonin cannot reach the receptor cells. Something's in the way. Something is not allowing the serotonin to reach the receptor cells. So when the doctor gives you medication for depression, usually an SSRI, it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, what that does is it allows your brain to be bathed in serotonin so that you get enough serotonin, the receptor cells can continually absorb serotonin, and you will feel a 
uh, moderation in your mood. Nothing is quite so bad anymore. And as that begins to work, you feel less depressed, less morbid, less maudlin, less like you want to jump off a bridge sometimes. Then we move into dopamine. In the central nervous system, dopamine plays an important role as a neurotransmitter in the modulation of regulating attention, cognition, movement, pleasure, impulsive behaviors, and hormonal processes. Parkinson's disease, attention deficit disorder, and schizophrenia all involve abnormalities in the dopamine system. That doesn't mean that these three disorders are related to one another. They just have a common denominator that there is dopamine involved, which again is why we need to know these things because as we move forward, we have to understand the value of these neurotransmitters and how they affect how we perceive the world and how we perceive ourselves. Finally, we have norepinephrine, which is similar to adrenaline. It is a hormone released in response to physiological changes caused by a stressful event. It regulates the fight or flight response, and that is, involves increasing heart rate and blood pressure, releasing energy for physical readiness. So, um, you know, many of us have seen the videos of a parent who sees their child uh, run over by a car and they go over and they're able to lift the car to release their child. And, you know, that's a 2,000 pound vehicle. That's amazing. Well, their body is so pumped that they can lift anything to save their child. Um, so high levels of norepinephrine results also in overly aggressive or hostile behavior. So, you know, norepinephrine can be a help in terms of the, you know, dealing with an emergency, but it can also cause us to get into fights. So that's it for this presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email or text me. If you are not in my class, please leave a comment and I will be happy to get back to you. Thank you and have a fantastic day.